This week's episode of Pop Culture Reference is brought to you by the UWM Professional Cinema Society's special Halloween horror double feature anthology screening happening on October 25th at 7 p.m. This will be located in the basement of Mitchell Hall at Classroom B91. Please come down. We're going to have candy and a lot of spooky fun time. Enjoy the show. Hello, everyone. Broadcasting live from a grimy Gotham City subway station, this is Pop Culture Reference, your one-stop reference for all things pop culture. I'm one of your hosts, Garrett Strother. I'm one of your other hosts, Seamus Connolly. I'm also here. Hi, hello. I'm Ricardo Salgado. How's everybody doing today? Doing good. I'm feeling. I'm feeling. I'm feeling good, man. It's a little um, rainy, but I think that's the perfect weather to talk about society. Truly, I, I had that kind of vibe coming in today. We live in a society. <laughs> Before we get into our main segment this course, week, which is going to be Joker, we're going to have to. We have some news to run through. I didn't bring in a lot. I don't know what you guys brought in. It's only for a show I watched. They released the new intro for season six of Steven Universe. Hey, man, that's it's, that's big enough news. That's, it's, also, that's great. it's the start of a new epilogue sequel series. They got a new name and everything. It's Steven Universe Future. Oh, cool. No kidding. Good good on them. I gotta really watch that stuff. I'm I'm so far behind on my like cool I animation. I recommend that show about like 80%. What, what's the other 20%? Well, no, it's, it's a little meandery, and um, it could use another writing pass. It just needs to be a little sharper. It's almost there, but I think the characters are very charming, and they make up for it. And, like, Steven is a main character, and then the themes that show explores, I think, are very interesting. But just a li- little sharper on the narrative. Right on. Good very stuff. Very nice. That's me. You got news? <laughs> Disney is now working on a new live-action Inspector Gadget. <laughs> I actually did hear about this. I'm very... <laughs> I'm, is it Matthew Broderick? Is it, is it... They've not announced anything other than that it's in development. On Disney Plus? Uh, they oh, didn't even say that. I suspect a Disney <coughs> Plus series is imminent. I didn't know that Disney owned Inspector Gadget. I wonder if it was part of the Fox acquisition. I looked into that and could not find any didn't information they make about the it. Two live action movies? Is Did they make the them? live action movie? Because they didn't make the cartoon. I think it might be them. So they might have the film them. license yeah. then. Yeah. I suspect it will not be set in the Matthew Broderick universe. Which is going to be thoroughly disappointing. I guess even though he was only in the first one, he wasn't Inspector Gadget in the second one, was he? No, it was French Stewart in the second yeah. one. Yeah, I liked the second one. I It was too young to realize if it was bad or not, but I, I'm pretty sure it was terrible. They're really bad. Both of them? Even Both the first one? Both of them are oh, that's really bad. That's what we're watching bad. for this show. Oh, no. Oh, well, whenever it, the new Inspector Gadget Disney live-action film comes out, that's what we have to do, Inspector Gadget retrospective. Who's playing Brain? Is who's Brain Brain's again? The dog. I was about to say that, and I thought I was going to sound stupid. <laughs> They'll get somebody funny to be the car, the Gadget Mobile. It'll be great. Are they bringing back the Gadget Mobile? I mean, what? why would you right? not bring back the Gadget Mobile? It'll probably be Mike Michael Keaton or somebody to be the chief. Oh, I thought you were going to say to be Inspector Gadget. Do you, no, like I'm what not, are the odds that it's Matthew that. Broderick? Because I feel like that's the only way I could even care. Zero. Okay. Who would you have as Matthew Broderick, Seamus, if not... Or as Inspector Gadget, oh, if not... Oh, no, we're casting Matthew Broderick now. <laughs> Matthew Broderick Different topic. Life. If you had to cast a Matthew Broderick <laughs> biopic, <laughs> who would you pick? i choose Ansel Elgort. Ansel Elgort's <laughs> too good of an actor to be Matthew Broderick, That was I think. too genuine and quick of a response for you to <laughs> not have thought about this before at some point. <laughs> God, I and also I don't know if I could even cast an Inspector Gadget on the spot. It's not something I think about. You very need often. somebody who's buffoonish. Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Oh God, I don't want more. Do we I do? Do we do it Captain America style, where he's all skinny before the surgery, <laughs> and then oh, after he becomes Inspector Gadget, he's all bulked up? I thought it was supposed to be more of a six million dollar man thing, you know? Like that's, that's already also got... coming back. Yes. What? What? All right, it's I Mark guess. Wahlberg. Uh, who he's who's responsible for the billion part? dollar man? I'm going to uh. throw this helicopter hat into the ring for the Inspector oh, Gadget. Oh, all right. Bill Hader. Yeah, man. Oh, I love it. I can see that for sure. That sounds like it could be a very yeah, fun He's time. already a cartoon man. He's a wacky boy. He could, he could put on a trench coat and a hat and 
gloves? No, that was probably the cartoon. He had like weird. Yeah, yeah he, he, has, he has gloves in the cartoon. Yeah, and yeah. I'm assuming it'll be more based on the cartoon than anything else because, goodness knows, there's not a lot of source material to work with in the Matthew Broderick or French Stewart movies. They yeah, go to I the they go to the Blue Monkey Bar in Inspector Gadget 2. That is something I remember about those Inspector Gadget that films. That sounds so familiar. Is You've that gone on for so long about Inspector Gadget? That's the news, man. I'm actually... This is, like, breaking news Do you to not me. have any news? Actually, this Inspector Gadget thing was probably what I was going to bring up if, if it was brought to me, because that was, that was a big part of my upbringing, for sure. I had Inspector Gadget 2 in, like, the clamshell plastic. Oh, of course. From Blockbuster, yeah. like, when it closed down. And that I didn't own the first one, I guess. Pretty sure they're trying to rob <laughs> Fort Knox in that movie. They are. All the gold bars. It's such a fun bad guy thing to do. Ugh. Is it Spectre Gadget 1 or 2 where Claw's facility is in a bowling alley? Or a bowling pin factory warehouse I think that's the second one because that sounds super familiar and I probably know the second one better than the first one yeah that sounds about right okay they have a time stopping machine we're getting too <laughs> they, far they absolutely because there's a there's a really gratuitous McDonald's product placement yeah sequence dude I remember where that. Inspector Gadget has time stopped there's a Dr. Pepper or a Coke spilling out of the McDonald's glass and I also remember that's when he's malfunctioning and his arms accidentally make the Mickey Mouse symbol, and he looks around and he goes, hey, look, Mickey, so those movies were Disney. Wow, Disney. you just, like, backwards walked yourself into, <laughs> like, a Sherlock realization. We cr- we cracked the code. Your mind palace must be horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> just, like, It's disgusting. all French Stewart. It's all French Stewart. It's only doing Third Rock from the Sun, the one episode of Community where French Stewart plays a French Stewart impersonator oh, and yeah. the Inspector Gadget, too. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I forgot about that. Oh, that's good stuff. I don't remember that episode. That description is just very funny to me. I want to say he's like a bully. Is yeah, that it, what I'm thinking of? Abed owes him a bunch of money because Abed keeps renting famous people impersonators oh, to act yeah, out movies yeah, with him. Yeah, yeah, and they have to go to the party and like work as impersonators, yeah. right? That's a great bit. That's a great show. So Troy is young Michael Jackson and Britta is old older Michael Jackson. Jackson. That's that great. That's beautiful. That's so much fun. Ugh. Gentlemen. It's time for some society. Get on the, the subway. We're going the, to the end of the line. Put on a happy society. face, Garrett. Put on a happy face. Because they Send really did. in do. the clown. Oh, you think this is funny? <laughs> is this a joke to you? <laughs> Murray, one small thing. Yeah. When you bring me out, can you introduce me as Joker? Oh boy. Okay. You well, you have notes. You have. I do have notes I because I thought also I also have notes. I have internal mental notes. All right. Well, Seamus, Ricardo and I saw it together. You saw it separately. Tell us what you thought of Joker. I am a little afraid to go first, <laughs> considering that you guys are probably gonna. I mean, it seems like a movie with a big... It's very polarizing. I As soon as I got out of the theater, and I have to say, I thoroughly enjoyed the movie. I thought it was it was a lot of fun. I saw it on 70mm projection, which was also a treat. I thought Joaquin Phoenix did a, a lovely job. As I was walking out, it was, you know, big crowd of people. A lot of, that was great, and a lot of, like, that was so derivative I couldn't even concentrate, and... I can kind of agree in a lot of points on that, but I kept thinking in my head the whole time, like, if they changed, like, two words in this whole script, like, if they changed the name of the city and the name Wayne, it could be just its own completely different, fun, original, non-Batman-connected story, and some of the stuff towards the end... Which we will not get into until spoilers. Right, of course. (laughs) That kind of made me think, like, I don't know, that it was it was trying to defy a lot of expectations, and that kind of rocked with some of the more staples in that Gotham realm, and I'm not really sure how I feel about that in such a, a standalone thing. Yeah, it was really bizarre, because it was simultaneously 
exactly the movie I thought it was going to be and somehow not at all the movie I thought it was going to be because there was a lot of the stuff that I expected from Joker, the we live in a society (laughs) stuff. I thought it was a lot of flash and very little substance. I couldn't tell what the movie was about. Genuinely, I do not know what that movie was about. Well, I guess the defense to that is it's supposed to be a character study. But at the same time, it's a lot of shallow observations on societal trends without actual context for it. So it's a lot of like, oh look, isn't this reminiscent of like Occupy Wall Street and haven't you seen stuff like this on the news? But it doesn't do anything with those real world observations that contextualize it. It doesn't try to say anything about them. It just places them in the movie to be edgy and to add flavor, it feels like. There's a line that he says at one point in the film where he is talking about how he's not political and he says, I don't believe in anything. I just thought it'd be good for my act. And that is the movie to me. Well, that's wow. prime Joker right there. But that goes into my thing. You clean, This movie clearly doesn't want to be about the Joker. Yeah, I think that it is fairly clear you, that... If you it, clearly don't want to use your source material. <laughs> you don't like what you are. All the Batman stuff, super distracting. You thought so. I, I guess I could feel that. Yeah, every yeah, Batman was, reference felt really... Which, it took me out of the movie because yeah. the rest of the world felt so little like Batman. And we'll talk a little bit more about more Batman stuff in spoilers. Okay. okay. I think that's because most, there, are, most of my there are more specific references. Um, but real quick, just before we get too far down this rabbit hole discussion, uh, Ricardo and I also saw it at the Gorgeous Oriental Theater in 70mm. Shout out. As um, did I. Something I really liked about this movie is I thought it was gorgeous. I thought it oh, was yeah, shot really well in the 70mm print is incredible. The Oriental didn't check the gate, though, before we our screening. There was a hair in the top left corner of the entire movie. Oh, or, that's uh, so I annoying. Did, I didn't notice. And <laughs> oh, I was a... not pleased about that. You started... But, tattooing things on your forehead is getting ready to Is that most of your notes? Is that why you don't like this movie? <laughs> no, I didn't say anything about that. Thank you, Ricardo. Oh. I didn't have as much of a problem with this movie politically as I expected to, mostly because I didn't feel like it had anything to say politically despite how politically charged a lot of the marketing and buzz around this movie before coming out was. Something I did have a problem with was its problematic depiction of mental illness. It chooses to focus so much yeah. on mental illness while villainizing it in a really destructive way, I think that people with genuine mental illnesses would be villainized in the world of this movie, and that's really upsetting. And I think it's also implied that his turn to violence is sponsored by not only his not mental illness, his medication and stuff. Yeah, like he specifically mentions not being on his medication, and it, there's a lot of talk. There's a pivotal plot point about his mother's mental illness, and I think that that's again an attempt to be edgy without thinking about real world consequences or context damn yeah i mean i can totally see where you're coming from with that there are a lot of like very non subtle parts that are trying to like hammer home the the point of uh we're kind of delving more into it okay you know i'll break the dam for spoilers with this yes please please do At the beginning of the movie, one of the first things we learn about the state of Gotham City is that there are super rats out loose in Gotham City. We see it on the news, and then later, after the event at the children's hospital when he's on the phone with his boss in the payphone, we see a super rat go by in the corner of the screen, and nothing else with the super rats has ever paid off. And they go to throw so much trouble to set up the fact that there are super rats in this universe, and then remind us that they're there. I thought they were going to bring in Superman. I thought that's where that was going. Yeah, I thought that was going to lead into a little more about, like, like doing a little hint, hint, nudge, nudge. I didn't notice the super rat in the phone booth part, mm-hmm. if I'm being honest. That was something that totally skated by me. What if this movie just took a turn? Super super rats are introduced, and they revealed they're kryptonite-powered super rats, and, and it's it, a totally different movie. It's, Ratman and the Joker. It turns into like the worst version of a universe it could be, possibly. Speaking of Ratman, Ricardo, let's run down some Batman references. <laughs> oh yes, please, let's do it. I'm more of the mind. Just, it just you don't like 
You're so, <laughs> yeah. you don't like your source material. <laughs> yeah, it's... Didn't he come out and say that, it's really? It's not based just on like anything. Everything that is pre-established is out the window because I There's say so. There's an interview quote from him where he's like, like, the way he sold it to Joaquin Phoenix was, this is a way to slip it by the studio system, man. Well, let's make a real movie and then we'll just slap the Joker on it, which is what you did. But why not just make a real movie yeah, then? Yeah. Yeah. I'm right there with you. you wouldn't get any funding. But you nah, didn't yeah. need funding for this movie. This movie costs like $50 million. You can get an independent film budgeted for yeah. $50 million. You can do True. that. Especially with a name like Joaquin Phoenix behind it. You could get crowdfunding. Yeah. You could have get, gotten picked up by Fox Searchlight or whatever yeah, with that true. kind of budget. Just called it literally, you know, there was another movie playing at the theater, Wrinkles the Clown. There's yeah. It Chapter 2. Killer clowns are just kind of commonplace now. They could have just written it a little more around. Um, I guess I'm viewing it as a comic book movie. And maybe I shouldn't be. Yeah, but it, I guess. It, but here's the thing: it goes out of its, despite the fact that they tried to make a real movie, to not base it on any specific source material. It also goes out of its way to remind you yeah, about, it, hey, Batman. <coughs> do you remember yeah, Batman? Yeah, yeah. They do what the do you Wayne know about killing. Batman? They do yeah, they, the I, Wayne killing. That was something I thought we were gonna finally, you know, avoid in something like this. It wasn't. Like, why is that in there? It's like, again. You can use the name Thomas Wayne, whatever. You didn't have to do that part. Like no one, no one forced you to do that. It's not saying anything about it. That's not giving us any more context for the character. It's not. I don't think that changing Batman's origin to be born out of a assassination in an alley versus a mugging in an alley really does anything to to change. Like I'm not thinking about oh how is Batman's character going to change because of that because it's all about. The death of his parents. I mean, it's and again, it's distracting. Yeah, <laughs> really distracting, especially in the third act of the movie. It's one of the final monologues in the movie. It is genuinely the last monologue in the movie, mm-hmm. and Joker's laughing, and we cut over to Bruce Wayne over his dead parents. Why? What is that saying about this character? He doesn't know about Bruce Wayne mourning over his parents. He didn't see that. Well, he touched his face that one time. But he saw his. <laughs> but he doesn't. He might not even know Thomas Wayne's dead. There's nothing to show us that. Yeah. It, it's just a wink, wink, nudge, nudge to the audience who knows intertextually what that means about Batman. Yeah. Diverging real quick about yes. the whole he touched his face thing. Thoughts on that? I don't know. It's kind of weird. Conflicted on that. I think it was genuinely creepy. Yeah. But mm-hmm. also, why is that in the movie? <laughs> yeah, it could. And, it, and why is it the Waynes and the fact that the audience gets that little tingle of like, I know who the Waynes are. I know yeah. who Bruce Wayne is. Oh, that English guy. Oh, must yeah, be that's Alfred. Alfred. Oh, God. I hate that we all <laughs> that that same thought. I, I almost thought at that point they were going to be like it was gonna be like almost as big as come along master Bruce or something like that where it's like I get it it's him. doesn't he say that does he am I just stupid He they never say Alfred but he does call him master Bruce oh damn I'm all this stuff is skating past me oh my god and it's just so on the nose yeah it really on is on the big red nose <laughs> and I don't understand why it diverges so much into the Wayne stuff because him interacting with a little boy, creepy. When we know that little boy is going to grow up to be Batman. <laughs> Not so creepy. They choose to subvert expectations in a way that I don't think really makes sense. They twist and turn the narrative at will, it seems. It, doesn't fi- it seems like the Joker's mental illness and his mother's mental illness mm. is the screenwriter. It's not a defined thing. It's whatever the screenwriter can do to make this character think it's one on thing. It's on purpose, man. It puts you in the mind of the killer, oh, man. God. Real quick, before we, we get past the Wayne slayings, I just want I'm to say... I'm not done with Batman. <laughs> no, I just... I'll, we'll get re- the, can, this I'm is getting to say, Batman, I swear. I wrote down, and part of my notes is, like, it does recontextualize a lot of Joker imagery, like chaos on the streets of Gotham and him, like, you know... Raining over it. That's you see that all the time. That happened on the animated series all the time. But now it's like coated in this grimy, and it's got all this baggage on it. I just wrote down it's Joker, but with all the fun taken out of it. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. a big part about why, which I guess that's what the Dark Knight was a little bit, and he's not always fun. But yeah, 
There's a reason. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just saying there's a reason that character is endured so long because he's fun to watch. And I guess it's just another reimagining. Mm. I'm having a lot of cognitive <laughs> dissonance with this movie. I did not have fun in this movie. There was not a yeah, single I would moment not des- where I had I wouldn't fun. describe this movie as fun. I didn't have fun. There were parts I liked. I was engaged okay, fair, the fair, entire fair, fair. time. I was invested. I didn't have any fun. Never had fun. And I don't need to have fun in a movie. Yeah. But a part of the Joker's appeal as a character, not necessarily, like, not positive appeal, but why he's an engaging villain. Why he's it, become this meme, this, this society meme. It's because he's enjoying what he's doing. Yeah. And I see that at the very end of this movie with that character when it's fully realized as Joker. Mm. But when you have your main character, which I'm not entirely sure the film doesn't perceive as a hero, which we'll talk about in a minute, there's a bit more dissonance there. I think dissonance is the right word, Ricardo, that you aren't able to take fun in it because the movie itself is reveling in villainy. Mm. And so that's not as fun. For me, that's not fun. For me, that made me sick to my stomach. And I had a reaction to this movie, which is what it wanted. It might be the only thing it wanted. God, yeah, you know what? That's actually not an entirely off-base thing to say. It's, It's really taking this... I hate to keep going back to society, but like... There's so many points in the movie. It's like this therapist saying that it's like they don't give a they don't give a damn about you and they don't give a damn about me. We're garbage and it's like the friend giving his mentally ill coworker a gun or whatever to use at his will. It's very it's trying to grab the the public attention right now and shake them and come say that see my movie. Seeing legit did scare me. Which part? Where he's like doing his thing, and the gun flips out. He's like, oh yeah, I was just very. <laughs> yeah, that, that got good. to me. Like it got under my skin a little bit. Like yeah. him because there have so many been so many times that a gun around a bunch of little kids yeah, in the last few years has not ended so well. Specifically, yeah. not good. Even in the context of the movie, you got the way I like. Why did he have that on him? Yeah, because the kids aren't going to mug him. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, he, that character, and I know it's the Joker, so you, you because you can just play the anarchy card anytime you want. Yeah, that's true. Really, little... That's what this movie wants to do, but that character's motivation is really inconsistent in a way that I don't think it's... Like, I don't think the first act of that movie's character's inconsistent motivation is intentional. I think the farther you get, the more inconsistent it gets, and that's intentional. The Joker is at the mercy of the screenwriter in this movie, not because he's coming from an organic place. I think Joaquin Phoenix's mm. performance is very consistent and very mm. well executed. Oh, definitely, because the majority of the movie is just him. And yeah. Again, I was engrossed the entire time, so he's doing something right. But I think Phillips' script doesn't land the way Phillips thinks it does. I didn't have a huge problem. Like, it didn't stand out to me as a bad script until... The monologue. <laughs> yeah, and I think on we live can, TV. Mm, yeah, 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 we can't talk about, about this movie without. It just felt like it was just Todd Phillips in Joker makeup. Oh, God, we can't talk about this movie without talking about the recent Todd Phillips interview that came out right when the movie came out. Oh boy! About how <laughs> let's get woke, boys. <laughs> oh, let's do it. About how Todd Phillips feels like he was forced out of comedy because he thinks that audiences are too sensitive now and don't think anything is funny. He was forced out of comedy because of Hangover Part 2. And Hangover Part (laughs) Part 3. Part 3, yeah. (laughs) And it's something that... It's a sentiment that is echoed by the Joker in the third act of this movie almost verbatim. Genuinely, the dialogue from Phillips' actual interview and the Joker's interview in the movie are eerily similar and it makes and had I not heard that Todd Phillips interview I would think okay he's doing a very good job at indicting this kind of mindset that's really ubiquitous right now that a lot of comedians are coming out and say we can't and acting like we can't do comedy because people get offended too easily and I would have said wow this is a really good way to comment on that but now knowing that Phillips himself thinks that way 
that completely changes the way I take it in the context oh, of the yeah. film. Is there any world where that interview was some kind of tool? Weird promotional like, material? It, like, is there any hope for that, or is this just, like, it's, it's sunk and dead? Because it seems like one very specifically over the other. Yeah, I. it's a shame. That it, that's what I'm coming from, is, like, damn, it's a shame. Like, but, I want it to be less of that. But also now, I feel like that, in a way, saved us a lot. That saved me, at least, a lot of of thinking about this movie in terms of how I need to contextualize that specific scene because now knowing the way Phillips thinks about that specific issue that the climax of the movie is centered around allows me to interpret it I think a lot yeah. easier are yeah we, well that's right can, are we able to separate the movie from the guy or is that is I, that's a little okay. big too, question it's too on the nose it's too on the that. nose it's because too blatant Art from the artist is a really hard thing to do, but in this case, it's so specifically this director's viewpoint being espoused by this specific character mm. that it's really hard not to separate, that he has willfully brought the discourse to this place. You know, it's not a Woody Allen movie where something happens with Woody Allen's life that is brought to the public, and also there are maybe some thematic similarities in some of his work. Where and I think and I haven't watched a Woody Allen movie since that Woody Allen news broke. I genuinely haven't. But I think this is a much more direct line from Todd Phillips to the ideology of this film. Yeah, because that interview was like it was literally the day before or the day of. It was the yeah, like, Thursday it came out. Oh, geez, God damn it! That's so unfortunate for so many reasons. Oh man, and there there was the there's that specific very important line it was the like what do you get when you cross ah, no, a mentally not... ill loner yeah with a society that abandons he says society, he says society in the society. movie <laughs> not only does he say society in the movie but he says society at in the most pivotal line in the movie yeah exactly and then it's the the punchline of that it's quote unquote thing, joke all the edgelords will be quoting it's gonna make all oh, the it's hot gonna topic be on facebook t-shirts. memes for real, it's gonna be like anonymous masks on T-shirts with that quote, and the punchline is, uh, "That's what you get, right?" And then he, you get what you deserve. You get what you, deserve, you get what you deserve, which is what the clown mask says to Wayne yep. at when he shoots Wayne. Which, oh, real quick, I want to bring this up before. Isn't the whole point of the murder of the Wayne parents that it was done by like a faceless criminal, and now it's like from the ideology of a. Of, like, his most... I don't know. This is this might be getting too far down, like... Batman lore, which Batman this movie lore. is simultaneously interested and not interested yeah, in exploring. Exactly, exactly. That's what I'm saying. It can't make up its mind, this movie. True. And I don't think it's studio notes versus not studio notes. I think it's Phillips himself doesn't know what he's trying to do. I think he's overreaching. I don't think he knows how to use Joaquin Phoenix in a way that is like I think Joaquin Phoenix's performance in this movie is fantastic mm. and not used to its full potential because of the poor writing and poor direction of the story as a whole. I think the gorgeous cinematography is unfortunately wasted in a lot of moments where I'm left unsure how to feel because of where we are in the story. Even though the cinematography is gorgeous mm. and telling me a much more compelling story than the actual narrative. Yeah, the cinematography is... While we're just going on stuff we like, yeah, the cinematography... Is gorgeous. The score, I, per, I think the score is fantastic. It's very yeah. unnerving. Absolutely, it, it it made me feel. Like, I listened to a chunk of it on my way here, and just like, just immediately, just makes me just uncomfortable. Okay. Also, I'm really happy with say what you will about Warner Brothers and the way they're handling DC. I'm really happy with Warner Brothers' commitment to 70 millimeter film and the way that they roll out films like this, Wonder Woman. Uh, oh, yeah, has a 70 millimeter print. Man of Steel, Justice League, both have 70 millimeter prints. I think Suicide Justice Squad. Justice League on <laughs> 70 millimeter. I'm not saying, crazy. I'm not trying to defend these movies, but no, I am I just, saying I want to see that now. <laughs> the hell would that even be? Warner God. Brothers is really committed to trying to bring out the the kind of roadshow aspect of film distribution, and I'm really enjoying that about a lot of their work. Uh, like I went to see Kong Skull Island in 70 millimeter, which is a Warner Brothers film, the know. only 70 millimeter print of it in existence, according to the director. Wow! But I thought that was really, really cool, and I'm glad that Warner Brothers is doing something like that. 
we not once did we touch on Zazzy Beats or Robert De Niro. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay, is Robert De Niro what Ricardo? I meant to look this up before I came. The television host that the Joker kills him and the audience of in The Dark Knight Returns, the one that looks like David Letterman. Mm. Is that the same can, canon character? So. Okay. So oh, that's the name Murray Franklin yeah. doesn't ring a bell to okay, me. So it's, it might be, I can't be 100%. Because I kept thinking in the movie about the Dark Knight Returns scene. Because yeah, it's, it's very similar. Mm-hmm. You, you know that scene, right? Yeah, I do. With the, yeah, yeah, I remember exactly what you're talking about. For any listeners who haven't read The Dark Knight Returns, Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns, there's a scene where the Joker goes on a talk show and then kills the entire audience mm-hmm. and the host with Joker toxin. And he has kind of a similar monologue and interaction with the host as he does to Robert De Niro in this movie right before he shoots Robert De Niro in the head. Yeah. Zazzy Beats. She's do- there. Yeah, they pulled the old... Tyler Durden in on us. the most obvious just to come on when are we gonna do the whole ah she's not real thing because she supports him like from the get go there's no reason for her to like him at all she's unrealistically supportive of him when he's bombing at the comedy club you don't see her cringing for him or anything like that you only see her laughing at his jokes in a way that is so clearly your projection of him I thought that was so telegraphed and derivative mm-hmm. I don't understand why it was in the movie other than to... Like, you could have amplified his loneliness in so many other ways, and that also leads into the vilification of mental health. Yes, it does. I mean, I will Plus, say... I just, about that scene where he, like, goes into her apartment and whatever, and she's like... like and she should be very scared to see him there. Yeah. <laughs> like, we get it. Like, oh, she wasn't real. Like, we got it when you first kind of implied it, but now we really get it. But let's flash back to every single one of their instances together without her in it, just so you really understand she wasn't real, like you guessed the moment she was introduced. See, now I'm going to look like an idiot, because it did get me for a, for a while. I didn't know it was going to be so... Like, I kind of guessed it in that it wasn't going to be what we saw, and that we were going to be getting a little surprise on what the actual perception was, but I did not... I didn't think that we're going to go full on like he's completely alone in all of these situations. I thought it was going to be kind of a, like, they were going to flash back and it was going to be, like, interactions between them playing out in a more, like, scary, awkward, creepy way for her that he perceived as something completely different. But that would have been interesting. That would have been saying something. See, yeah, that's probably me just trying to, like, f- <laughs> stitch yeah, together yeah, plots as they go I along. About that. that is... Good, just sort of getting a different perspective on it. It's like, yeah, he yeah. thought it was going great, but it's actually it's very awkward and creepy. I, I read in my notes here, I got kind of a tangent. Oh, please. Where I just wrote a different Joker movie, the way it's used. <laughs> That's like a whole episode. The different. Like, clearly they're doing like King of Comedy hallucination stuff. Like, use that. But you can do your edgy character study, but also, like, use your comic roots. Yeah. Like, in his hallucinations, have it be... Like, they do a little bit of that, where he's on the stairs, and, like, he's doing his dance or whatever, and it mm. cuts to the cops watching him, and he just looks like some douchebag on yeah, the air. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> like, use that where he's... How he sees himself, like, the Joker, the character is very egotistical, very maniacal. Mm-hmm. Just builds himself up to be that in his own mind, and we always come back to reality, where he is just awkward, creepy, just alone... That's not the reality this movie is interested in having, though. (laughs) Yeah, truly. I just think you could use those hallucinations to, like, call back to the more kind of fantastical elements of the comics. So you, like, actually use your source material. Agreed. I think we need to wrap up on Joker if we have any final thoughts. (laughs) Final thoughts? You know what? See it. Don't see it. You're going to be listening to a million people talk about it all the time for the next few months, regardless (laughs) So I guess at least get some context. I think you the know, discourse you know is super overblown. This movie's <laughs> not going to incite violence. This, yeah. this movie is just not as controversial as it thinks it is. The hype is not real. I would say, you know, yeah, just go see it for... That's our like, rating system for movies. <laughs> is the hype real or is the <laughs> hype not real? Where does it fall There's the no hype in between. I, I would say just see it for the good parts, like... If you can see it on 70 millimeter, if they're doing that, like it's, it's gorgeous. Yeah. It's worth it to just like visually look at it, and the like. Ricardo said the score is 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 quite good. Joaquin 
does his job and he does it well, but uh, just be ready for a lot of polarizing opinions for the foreseeable future. To be clear, I, at least I personally did not hate this movie. Yeah, I thought yeah, I, I didn't, didn't hate, hate it, it either. I was just very frustrated by it. If anything, I thought it was mediocre. Yeah, mediocre. Yeah, but... Joker. All right, let's move on. Play the play the transition music. Yeah, let's get out of here. That is a hype is not real. <laughs> yeah, meaty Joker. Meaty Joker. All right, it's time for our next segment. Where's Riley? <laughs> oh, my, this is my favorite segment of the <coughs> podcast. You got any guesses? Do I have any guesses? Yeah, you, where do you think Riley is right now? The bathroom. Let's find out. A one. Ricardo, you don't have any guesses? A three. I'm gonna guess in this recording studio. <laughs> no, <laughs> Look under not. your chair. He is at work. Well, nice boring answer for damn. you. Damn. And that would be at where, Garrett? <laughs> <laughs> As a courtesy to Riley, I will not be handing out Riley's place Fair of enough. employment. This, hey, this, what's Riley's address? Yeah, what's his phone number? Let's I actually put it on don't the... know Riley's address, so <laughs> jokes on you. Jokers on you. Let's okay. move on. Let's get out of here. Very Society. quickly, <laughs> this week's reference in pop culture reference is going to be lampshading. A writer's trick to help ease the audience suspension of disbelief by calling attention to a plot element or trope that the audience might not swallow so easily. Uh, a really obvious example of this is something like Deadpool, which does it with the entire movie. Right. Where it says, ah, oh, we're going to do a stupid basic superhero plot of having to go save the girl from the abandoned place that doesn't make any sense for the villain to be, but then it still does that. Or how three jerks who start a podcast make jokes about all the assholes that start podcasts. <laughs> oh boy, let's not get too meta here. Uh, so yeah, that has been Lampshading. On to our next segment, Hell is Other Podcasters. Welcome to Hell is Other Podcasters, our segment where we discuss this week's Good Place episode. We don't have a lot of time to talk this week, but I think that's okay because it was really kind of a light episode. Oh, yeah. Part two of A Girl from Arizona, where we see our Soul Squad continue to try to get to know and influence the new humans in the neighborhood. As we know, Chidi is now in the neighborhood as a human participant that has no memory of his relationship with Eleanor or any of the other characters in the show. First, let's just go through the episode kind of quickly, chronologically. The Soul Squad decides to focus on Brent, who is the really big jerk, (laughs) the worst man in the world of the humans in the neighborhood. And no matter what they do... He's very topical. (laughs) Yeah, he is very topical. (laughs) And no matter what they do, he is always convinced that he deserves to be in a better place than where he is, no matter how much The better place. The best place. The best place, excuse me. The Backdoor sequel series? I kind of love that idea. I think it's a very funny concept, and the way that they get him to start doing nice things is by telling him that if he does enough good things that he will be in contention for entry into the best place. The I place swear where... to God, Garrett, if the best place doesn't pay off as a real location. <laughs> that would be a lot of that fun. That would be very funny. I would like that a lot. But when things aren't going so well before they come up with that plan to stop Brent, the members of the team without Eleanor have a meeting saying that they're concerned about Eleanor's leadership and her relationship with Chidi impacting her ability to guide them. And then Eleanor overhears it quitting the soul squad leading to the best episode certainly or the best character moment for eleanor this is what the whole series has been building to as far I as i'm loved concerned her speech this, this scene was amazing her growth as a character and absolutely uh, it's, it's just brilliantly performed by Kristen bell a lot of what ricardo and i talked about last week about her just being this girl from Arizona with the fate of the universe on her shoulders is really examined in this scene with Michael where she is out in the concourse of the neighborhood having a panic attack about how she's going to deal with all of these issues that she's having. With Michael radiates heavy dad energy. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And it's a really touching scene. It shows how far Michael's character has come and how much of it is because of Eleanor. I think it's a really touching moment between those two characters, and I think it really sums up the entire show as a whole about the frustration and repeated failure of humanity and how you just have to keep trying to be a better person. Michael says at the end, 
you try a thousand times because maybe the thousand and first time might work. This show's getting a little more heartfelt than I yeah. had signed on for originally, if I'm Isn't being honest. And I, I really like it. Michael, is it Schner? How do you say it? Michael, Michael Schur. Michael Schur. Michael Schur, Michael Schur's yeah. work. Yeah, he, he, yeah, he tricks you almost. And, uh, it's great. The ending to Parks and Rec gets me every time. The oh, ending to Parks and Rec God, is yeah. hard. <laughs> yeah. But it's really good. I have one question real quick before we move on with the episode. Everybody apologizes to Eleanor after that. Does Eleanor deserve an apology? Hey, man, she's trying her best. But they were voicing valid concerns about yeah, her leadership ability. Wasn't... They weren't saying necessarily that they were going to start a coup or anything. They were just talking as people who are all invested in this specific issue. Yeah, this the most important issue in the universe. Yeah. And, like, you know, it, would, it makes sense to, like have a little wavering of faith in a situation that is so important. And I'm glad Eleanor is stepping up, but at the same time, I felt like maybe she didn't deserve the apology that she was given. Okay. But she does really step up after that. I loved seeing her introduce Simone and Chidi and how that all worked. Her strategy to get those two together is to tell Chidi that he and Simone are soulmates. And after she tells Chidi that they're soulmates, he has this really wonderful moment where he gets so excited about how he was never in love on earth and Eleanor just looks back at him and says I know (sighs) and it breaks my heart Kristen Bell destroyed this episode truly she it's it's yeah, it, it, it shocked me. Some watch of the her destroy even more on Veronica Mars, the backdoor oh, pilot for our Veronica Mars save podcast. Save it for the rec center, you you <laughs> boy. Ricardo, the you gun. don't get a rec center now because <laughs> of that. I, oh, wait, continue if, if you have more. I just thought that was wonderful. And then turning that into the really incredible scene with Chidi and Simone and watching Chidi work, not because he's necessarily confident or brash but because he's just a really smart kind person he says to simone what do you have to lose by treating people with kindness and respect and that sums up that show again like i think this episode is what this entire series has been building to in a really eloquent simple sweet way it's such a pleasant show it really is which is weird for uh for a show about hell yeah about literally being tortured for eternity and i think with the this first two-part episode and it feeling so like like this is the culmination of a lot of the more wacky adventures that have gone through here this is going to be like one hell of a, a finale season and you you can feel it I agree Let's move on to save the rec center Yeah let's do it Great Well Ricardo I, you <laughs> already got your Yeah what did you, that, what did you talk about cow, huh, man? buddy Oh you you don't why I do it? heavily recommend Veronica Mars. If you like Kristen Bell, if you like The Good Place, watch her on Veronica Mars. Now streaming on Hulu. <laughs> seasons one through four. You can find the movie somewhere else. They're Rented books. from iTunes. Whatever. It's, it's great. It's very dark. It's Here's awesome. a recommendation for you guys. They put out that Marvel box set. Have you seen this? Oh, oh it's so pretty. God, it oh, looks God, insane. I want it so bad. <laughs> That, that's a rec center for a rich man, my friend. It's my very My soul pretty. left my body. Gary, you know how I love me some extravagant... I've heard you talking about the inevitable Infinity Saga box set for months now yeah. and how excited you are about it. And now that I've seen it, I'm excited too, but it's so much. It's $540. <laughs> $549.99. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a it's an expensive box set. It's... It's wild, but if we pool our resources together... We still will not have <laughs> enough money. <to laughs> yeah, truly. Oh, God. Seamus, do you have a rec center? I do, and uh, as per last week's uh, rec center, I'm going to put out my, my more strongly opinionated uh, recs out early so they don't get sniped by you two, because we all share very similar stuff. Uh, Ricardo, you might be kicking yourself for not coming up with this a little sooner, but... The sitcom Frasier is something <laughs> so special in my heart. I'm going to say it's the best written and funniest sitcom in human history. And I will stand by that until the day I'll I die. I'll back that up. It's, yeah, it's a pretty brilliant show. It's it's so funny. I, did, I never even had to watch 
Cheers, which Frasier is a spinoff of Cheers. I never even... I tried to watch Cheers after, and I was like, how many seasons till Frasier shows up? <laughs> this isn't worth it. I'm out of here. <laughs> it's, just, it's very smart humor. It, it doesn't... The way I've always liked down. Frasier, the way you and me see Cheers is more of a Frasier prequel. Than exactly, a show on, honest in to and God, of that's how I feel. There's some episodes with Cheers characters. You'll you'll get it. It's fun. Go. It's on Netflix. It's on Amazon. It's if you on, have a ooh. streaming service, go watch it. It's more than worth your time. All right, and finally, my save the rec center this week is keeping with our main segment theme. I've been replaying Batman Arkham Asylum, Ooh. and boy, is it so good. Ricardo, last Such week, oh. came over and was like, Garrett, do you, mind if, do you mind if I just watch you play <laughs> Arkham Asylum? That's Quick how Garrett. much I love Arkham Asylum, Arkham City, Arkham Knight. I'll just watch other people and play them. Quick interjection, he also did that with me about <laughs> a year and a half ago. So, um, I'm about halfway through percentage-wise now, and so I don't... I don't think I actually... I played it when I was 13 on my Xbox, and I don't think I ever actually finished it. I think I'm into to unmapped territory now. So I'm, oh. I'm enjoying it quite a lot. I'm getting a lot out of the narrative. It's a really good use of the rogue gallery, and Batman is just really fun to be. Yeah. It's such a good game, Garrett. It is a very good game. It is... Uh, just to me personally, it is the just pitch perfect adaptation outside of the comic books and with that piece of Batman information I think we should sign off I have been Garrett I have been Seamus I've been Ricardo guys make sure to go over to the Professional Cinema Society Halloween Anthology Horror Double Feature featuring Trick or Treat and Creep Show that is what day Seamus that's October 25th at 7pm in Mitchell Hall in the basement in room B91 Thank you so much for listening, guys. See you next week. Go live in a society.